Namaskar to all the viewers across the country. I am Sanjula Halder, Deputy Director in the Directorate of Income Tax, PRPNP, at Mayur Bhavan, New Delhi. Welcome to another session from Samvad. As part of Samvad series, today we bring to you discussion on the topic Harmonization of Provisions Pertaining to Charitable Institutions and Trusts. For the discussion, we have with us today Sri Anurag Sahai, Principal Commissioner of Income Tax, Bengaluru. Sri Anurag Sahai belongs to the 1991 batch of the Indian Revenue Service and is presently working as Principal Commissioner of Income Tax Verification Unit, Bengaluru. Sir is an alumnus of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi and National Law School of India University, Bengaluru. Sir has also pursued public policy at the University of Washington, USA. Sir has worked within the department in Kolkata, Chennai, Mumbai and Bengaluru in various capacities including specialized verticals of international taxation, exemptions and on deputation. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation for this episode of Samvad on the topic Harmonization of Provisions Pertaining to Charitable Institutions and Trusts. Thank you very much, Sanjula. I'm very happy to be here. So going further, I would like to ask you that recently the Honorable Supreme Court of India has passed a landmark judgment in the case educational charities and general public utility charities. Could you please elaborate on that? You see, Supreme Court in October of uh, 2022 passed two landmark judgments, as you said. One in the context of educational charity in the case of New Noble Educational Society and the second in the case of GPU charities Ahmedabad Urban Development Authorities and others. Both these judgments by the Honorable Supreme Court have far-reaching implications and have settled a huge controversy and litigation with regard to the implementation of laws relating to charitable institutions in the country. Let us try and understand the major crux of the decision of Honorable Supreme Court in the case of educational charities. In the case of educational charities, in the New Noble decision, Honorable Supreme Court has dwelt on and interpreted the word solely in the context of Section 1023C of the Act. In the language of the Act, approval under Section 1023C is available to educational entities only if they are solely engaged in educational charities. So there was a huge controversy and litigation which went all the way up to Supreme Court as to what this word solely means. The Honorable Supreme Court has held now that solely does not mean mainly, solely does not mean predominantly, solely means exclusively, solely means only. So the import of this decision is that an educational charity, in order to avail exemptions and a, under, under the laws of Income Tax Act, has to be engaged exclusively in educational activity and not in any other allied activity. The Supreme Court in its decision has also given instances as to what would be the meaning of the term solely. Say, for instance, an educational institution is engaged in transporting the children from their residences to the institution and back, or it is engaged in selling of textbooks relating to, the, uh, uh, to education of uh, the pupil of that organization, or giving residential hostel facilities. All these would cons be considered within the term solely and would mean educational purposes. However, in distinction, the Honorable Supreme Court has held that if that educational institution is engaged, say in renting out its premises or during the vacation giving its premises to paid courses for running 
पेड कोर्सेज और इवन एजुकेशनल कोर्सेज विच आर नॉट रन बाई इट बट बाई एनी अदर एंटिटी और यूजिंग इट्स प्रेमिस फॉर एनी अदर कमर्शियल पर्पज ऑल दिस वुड नॉट कम अंडर द मीनिंग ऑफ द टर्म solely for educational purposes within the meaning of section 1023c of the act the supreme court has also very consciously held that this interpretation of the word solely is at a complete and radical departure from its earlier decisions hence the honorable supreme court has held that the implementation of this interpretation going forward will be pros prospective and not retrospective so educational institutions have been given time to recalibrate their objects and recalibrate their activities in the line of the expectation of honorable supreme court that when they are taking educational activities they are only engaged solely and exclusively in that educational activity so this is in short the sum and substance of the decision of honorable supreme court in the context of educational charity thank you sir so i am sure that the viewers will take the law laid down by honorable supreme court as approved under section 1023c for planning the future activities because the law is applicable prospectively so could you please elaborate on the highlights of the general public utilities charities see the gpu decision is in the case of amdavad development authority and a bunch of 100 other cases and it has also settled a huge litigation and controversy on the interpretation of proviso to section 215 of the act the proviso to section 215 basically states that a gpu charity can only undertake any activity or service in the nature of commerce or business only if it is in the course of furthering its actual objects and in the made in the course of its actual carrying out of activity and also the second condition is that provided such commercial activities does not does not ex exceed 20% of its total receipts so a huge controversy had arisen and the several cases reached up to the highest court in the land and the primarily the issues in contention were that what constitutes actual carrying out of activity and whether plowing back of income from any activity would make an activity permissible within the proviso of the section 215 of the act the honorable supreme court in its decision has very categorically held that simply because the profits of an activity undertaken by a gpu charity is being plowed back for the objects of the gpu for the purposes of gpu as mentioned in its objects clause or moa does not make itself permissible under the proviso to section 215 of the act so it is very clear departure from the various decisions said by uh, given by honorable high courts across the country plowing back of income in to feed the charity is not permissible under section 215 proviso to section 215 of the act the second major thing which the decision of honorable supreme court has done is to state that any activity which can be considered permissible under proviso to section 215 cannot be an incidental activity or incidental to the main objects or any allied activity if any activity is carried out during the course of furtherance of that object of that gpu and during carrying out that object certain surplus is earned only that surplus then becomes logically incidental 
and only that surplus will be permissible under the scheme of the act. The Supreme Court in its landmark decision has also evolved a concept of significant markup. So, a new test of significant markup test has been envisaged in the decision and Supreme Court has also elaborated it and illustrated it. In the decision it is mentioned that say the example of Gandhi Peace Foundation. Now, say if it is selling books written by the father of the nation or say a blood bank is conducting charitable activity or a low cost housing is being provided to the poor all with a nominal markup of cost plus certain administrative expenditure or a minor nominal markup of profit that would be considered acceptable. However, if say the same Gandhi Peace Foundation were publishing an expensive coffee table book and deriving substantial profit from it and the markup above cost is significant. Now, that would not be an activity which is permissible under section proviso to section 215 of the act. Similarly, if, if, if marriage halls are being provided to the poor at low cost or above slight markup above the cost that is permissible, but if specialized features are being granted to the to the marriage parties, facilities are extra facilities are granted and substantial profits are being generated and there is a significant variation between cost plus administrative expenditure and the receipt amount, then again that will not be permissible. So, these two things have very significantly been brought out in the GPU charity context that what would be considered uh, permissible, what would be actual carrying out of objects of the trust and also what would be a significant market and what would be a nominal markup. So, these are the major uh, points emerging from Ahmedabad decisions. The second major aspect which I would like to highlight and bring to the attention of the viewers is with regard to statutory boards, corporations, etc. Now, here the Honorable Supreme Court has held that these statutory boards and corporations essentially provide public service. Now, if they are charging any amount whatever name it be called fee cess or any other cons consideration and that is mandated by the law, then that per se cannot be business, that cannot be commerce. The Honorable Supreme Court has held that this fee cess is being charged essentially for a public function and if they, they were to be loaded on as business or commercial activities then ultimately it will result in higher burden being placed on the ultimate consumer which is the citizen of this country. So, here the honorable supreme court has made a fine distinction that in case of statutory boards or corporations if the mandate of the law is to charge for an essential service such as water supply or, or drainage or electricity or transport mandated under the law then these will essentially be public functions. Taking cue from this view of the Honorable Supreme Court, amendment has been proposed by Finance Act 20, Finance Bill 2023 by introduction of section 1046A of the Act. Now, section 1046A proposes to exempt income of statutory boards etcetera which are engaged in public function of urban infrastructure, housing, drainage, water supply and the like and these institutions can now apply under section 1046 when once the finance bill is approved and it becomes the law of the land 
and such institutions can be notified under section 1046A making their income exempt under the scheme of the act. So the introduction of section 1046A flows directly from the decision of Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Ahmedabad Urban Authority, the Urban Development Authority and others. So this in some and substance is the major flavor of the decision of Honorable Supreme Court in the context of GPU charities. Thank you, sir. So ITR 7, a specified income tax return form for trusts and charitable institutions has been notified in the Gazette on 14th February 2023. So could you please tell our viewers what is the difference in ITR 7 compared to the earlier years? Yeah, I would be happy to answer that question. As you rightly mentioned, ITR 7 has been very recently notified for assessment year 23-24. Primarily, the new ITR 7 reflects the major changes which has been brought about by Finance Act 21 and Finance Act 22. And these changes have been made applicable from assessment year 23-24. The major changes which I would like to bring to the notice of the viewers. Number one, a new schedule 115 BBI has been introduced in ITR 7. Viewers will recollect that 115 BBI details taxability of specified income. So that detail is being captured in ITR 7 because such specified incomes are taxable at the rate of 30%. Second, a new schedule has been introduced in Schedule D, which details the amount which has been taxed in earlier years under Section 111B, that is where deemed accumulation is being carried out beyond five years. Thirdly, a new schedule has been made which basically merges the capital and revenue expenditure. In the earlier ITR 7, there was a Schedule ER for revenue expenditure and Schedule EC for capital expenditure. Now it has been simplified and made into a common schedule which captures both revenue as well as capital expenditure. The second major change in the present ITR 7 which I would like to flag for the notice of the viewers is in Part TI of ITR 7. In part TI now, we have three parts. Part 1 is where the income is exempt under section 1023C or 12AB of the Act. So all the assessees falling under these scenarios will file in part 1 of the TI. Part 2 relates to income of specific entities such as electoral trust, political parties, superannuation funds, employee welfare funds, etc. Notified under 1046, all these entities would file in part 2 of TI. And there is the last part which is the part 3 of TI, which basically deals with cases where exemptions has been denied. Now, there may be cases where exemptions would be denied. Let's take for instance, non-filing of audit report. In case of non-filing of audit report, the exemption is denied and now the income is taxed and assessed as per the provision of section 1310 of the Act and the related proviso in section 1023C. So, when uh, income is taxed after denial of exemptions, those assessees will form, file their income in, file their statement in part 3 of the TI. So, these are the significant changes. Apart from that, a new schedule J has been introduced, which basically enables reconciliation of figures between the balance sheet and the ITR 7. Finally, Schedule J, which depicts the funds and investments of the charitable entity, has been simplified in ITR 7 and a new reconciliation format 
between schedule j and the balance sheet of the taxpayer has been introduced which will make life much simpler for the charitable entities so these are the major changes which has been brought about by the new itr7 reflecting the changes made in the last two finance acts to sum up i would like to impress on the viewers that the income tax department in the last 3 to 4 years has undertaken a great deal of rationalization changes in the field of charitable institutions through the leveraging of technology simplification of tax laws bringing tax certainty and clarity in various contentious and litigious issues the process has been made completely online and the timelines have been provided where they were not there earlier for instance on cancellation of registration so in various areas the effort has been to simplify the law and also to trust the taxpayer and deliver better taxpayer services we hope this session gave you the necessary insights into the significant changes proposed in the finance bill 2023 related to the provisions of charitable institutions and the changes in itr 7 with this we come to the end of today's session on harmonization of provisions related to charitable institutions and trusts i thank you all for joining us for this episode do follow us on our social media handles on facebook instagram linkedin youtube and twitter and keep watching for updates on more educational and informative content until the next time from samvad thank you and jai hind